group of islands which lie almost north and south along 145 degrees east longitude and between 13 and 20 degrees north latitude. The north-south length of the group is about 420 miles. Second largest and most populous of the Marianas is Saipan Island, approximately 12 and a half miles long, five miles wide in the central portion, with a total area of about 72 square miles. In this area, the year can be divided into two seasons, the dry season from December to June and the wet season from July to November. Between May and October, easterly winds predominate, but with considerable percentages from southerly and westerly directions. Velocity from 10 to 11 knots. Summer is the wet season with an average of from 17 to 23 rainy days per month. In general, the east coast of Saipan was free of barrier or fringing reefs. The south coast has a narrow fringing reef and a steep gradient. The west coast was almost entirely protected by fringing and barrier type reefs, breached once at Charan Kanoa and in four places at Garapan. The only good anchorage was located off Charan Kanoa, outside the reef, during easterly winds. With a few unimportant exceptions, landing beaches along the eastern coast were non-existent. Along the south coast there were abrupt banks and undercut cliffs with a maximum elevation of 50 feet. With the exception of a few minor sections, the entire western coast has a fairly wide sandy beach. From the base of Aguinian Point to the reef opening near Charan Kanoa, the beach extended 2,750 yards in length and was 7 to 15 yards wide. Wharves, a wharf and three piers at Tanapag Harbor. This is the only harbor in which there was a partial protection from all winds. The entrance channel was about 1,800 yards long, 235 feet wide, with a minimum depth of 22 and a half feet. The government pier at Garapan, and 900 yards north, there was a boat construction and repair yard. There also was a pier at Charan Kanoa. Along the center of Saipan, running generally north and south, was a mountainous ridge. Principal peaks were Mount Tapacho, 1,554 feet. Mount Marpi, 853 feet. Mount Kagman, 479 feet. Mount Nafutan, 407 feet. On the eastern side of Marpi Point, were a number of limestone caves. At Mount Marpe, there was a single sheer cliff almost 600 feet high. The northern portion of the ridge was broken by a series of two to four terraces, separated by rocky cliffs. Charan Kanoa Marsh, also called Lake Susupi, included a freshwater lake. Half a mile southwest of the lake was a swamp covering 25 acres. Three sugarcane plantations were situated on Saipan. Number one occupied most of the southern portion. Number two formed the east central peninsula. And number three occupied all of the flat land around the northern end, a distance of about 12 miles. About 70% of Saipan was under sugar cultivation. In the vicinity of Charan Kanoa, some of the area was devoted to vegetable farming. Garapan Town, the main settlement, the second in size in the Marianas, being exceeded in population and importance only by Aganya in Guam. Population about 10,000, three-fourths of whom were Japanese. Charan Kanoa covered an area of about one square mile. There were a number of other small settlements. Good roads encircled the island and also crossed the island at Karabera Pass from Flores Point to the eastern coast and east from Charan Kanoa. A good network of roads extended throughout the southern part of the island. Practically all roads could be shelled from the sea. A fairly well-developed system of secondary roads and trails existed in most sections of the island. A railroad with several spur lines almost encircled the island. 
there were approximately 20,000 Japanese civilians. The natives consisted of about 4,000 Kanakas and Okinawans. The population was mainly engaged in sugarcane production. In general, there was little food produced in excess of the needs of the civilian population. There was little fresh water. Most of the drinking water was obtained by storage of rainwater. Sanitation at Saipan was generally fair. However, there were no sewage systems. Toilet systems were primitive. Mosquitoes were abundant in all parts of the island, however, not the Annapolis type. Prevailing diseases were dysentery, eye troubles, yaws, dengue fever, tuberculosis, typhoid, and paratyphoid, as well as occasional cases of venereal diseases and a few isolated cases of leprosy. The principal airfield in Saipan was the Aslito Strip. At Charankanoa, there was a runway strip, which actually was little more than the widening of a road at that point. The third airfield was on the northern coast near Moppy Point. A major seaplane base with five hangars and two large ramps was at Flores Point. From studies of recent reconnaissance photographs, it was apparent that the garrison forces in the Marianas had been considerably reinforced since the latter part of February, and it was estimated that by the Saipan target date, the garrisons would consist of a total of about 30,000 men, including 7,000 construction personnel. The Japanese were capable of establishing a strong defense at all probable landing beaches, but withholding a strong mobile reserve. It appeared from a study of recent aerial reconnaissance. The Japanese had installed strong defensive installations in the whole of Naputan Point, the Aslito airfield area, the vicinity of the Charankanoa airstrip. The area at the southern end of Garapan town. The area at the northeast end of Garapan town. The area to the southeast of Marpy Point vicinity of the new airstrip, the area north of Flores Point, and would use a large mobile reserve to meet the attacks as they would develop. Landmines were to be expected on all probable landing beaches as well as on exits from beaches. While major units of the Japanese fleet were capable of opposing the operation, it was believed that these units would not interfere except for hit and run raids on detached units of American forces. The Japanese were capable of launching more powerful air and submarine attacks than had been heretofore launched in any previous Central Pacific operation. An operation plan was issued 26 April 1944. The mission. Expeditionary Troops, Task Force 56, with Joint Expeditionary Force, Task Force 51, beginning on Dog Day, will seize, occupy, and defend Saipan, Guam, and Tinian Islands in order to obtain their use and deny them to the enemy. Then we'll prepare for further amphibious operations as directed. That portion of Task Force 56 concerned with the attack on Saipan and under the command of Lieutenant General H.M. Smith was composed of Northern Troops and Landing Force. The organization, Corps Troops of the 5th Pib Corps, 4th Marine Division, 2nd Marine Division, 24th Corps Artillery, 10th Marines reinforced, 14th Marines reinforced and other field artillery units, and to aircraft artillery. There were other attached units such as signal battalions, medical battalions, engineers, air warning companies, amphibious reconnaissance battalions, amphibian tank and tractor battalions and garrison forces. In support, 27th Infantry Division, part of the Southern Landing Force. In addition, the 77th Infantry Division was to be alerted at Oahu and prepared to land and support as directed. Task assignments for the Northern Troops and Landing Force called for. The 1st Battalion, 2nd Marines reinforced, to land during the night of Dog Minus One Day on beaches at Magician Bay and move inland to seize Mount Tapacho and defend it until relieved. 
This landing was cancelled prior to embarkation, and the 1st Battalion was placed in Corps Reserve. It reverted to division control on D-Day. The 4th Marine Division reinforced at Howe Hour on Dog Day to land on beaches blue and yellow, seize objective 01 and assign zone of action, then on division order, advance rapidly and seize Aslito Airfield and that part of Saipan Island in its assigned zone of action. Be prepared for further operations on order. The 2nd Marine Division reinforced at Howe Hour on Dog Day to land on beaches red and green. Seize objective 01 and assign zone of action. Then on division order, advance rapidly and seize Mount Tapacho and Mount Tipopali and that part of Saipan Island in its assigned zone of action. Protect the left, north flank of the northern landing force and be prepared for further operations on order. The 10th Artillery Regiment of the 2nd Marine Division with the 2nd 155 Howitzer Battalion attached to land on Saipan on order of the Commanding General, 2nd Marine Division, and be in direct support of the assault echelon in the division zone of action. The 14th Artillery Regiment of the 4th Marine Division, with the 4th 105 Howitzer Battalion attached, to land on Saipan on order of the Commanding General, 4th Marine Division, and be in direct support of the assault echelon in the division zone of action. The 24th Corps Artillery to be prepared to land on Saipan Island on Dog Day or any time thereafter on order of the Commanding General Northern Troops and Landing Force. It was to be in general support for the purpose of reinforcing the fires of the 10th Marines and 14th Marines. It was further to be prepared on order for further operations against Tinian Island. Field Artillery. The 27th Infantry Division Artillery and Floating Reserve under Expeditionary Troops Control to be prepared to pass the control of Commanding General Northern Troops and Landing Force on order and to land on designated beaches of Saipan and to support the Northern Troops and Landing Force. The Anti-Aircraft Artillery to land on order on beaches to be designated, furnish anti-aircraft protection in the zones of action of the 2nd and 4th Marine Divisions and revert to control of Saipan Garrison Force on order. The Saipan Garrison Force to land on order on beaches to be designated, establish initial anti-aircraft defenses, initiate airfield repairs, and execute assigned base development missions. The 27th Infantry Division to be prepared to land on order on designated beaches on Saipan in the Charon Kanoa area, in Tanapag Harbor area, on the west coast north of Tanapag Harbor or in Magasiani Bay in support of the Northern Landing Force. The order further directed that a naval force including transport divisions carrying reserve regiments of Northern Troops and Landing Force were to conduct a demonstration in the area northwest of Tanapag Harbor on Saipan from one half hour before sunrise on Dog Day to about how plus one hour on Dog Day. Naval Gunfire Support Mission. Beginning early in the morning on Dog Minus Two Days, fast battleships and destroyers of Task Force 58 were to destroy aircraft, render airfields temporarily useless, destroy coast defenses, and to aircraft batteries and artillery guns on both Saipan and Tinian. And on Saipan, burn all unburned cane fields lying south of Mucho Point Bluff Point destroy enemy defenses and personnel, and cover minesweeping of the shelf to the westward of Saipan. On dog minus one day by bombardment group one, counter battery fire, area bombardment and interdiction fire on Saipan, and counter battery fire and target of opportunity fire on Tinian. This was to begin at daybreak for both islands and continue throughout the day on Saipan, with a mission to destroy as many coast defense guns anti-aircraft batteries, artillery weapons, enemy defenses, and personnel as possible. Particular attention was to be paid to the destruction of gun positions in Magasiani Bay and the beach defenses and installations on the selected landing beaches. Close supporting fire was to be provided to cover the beach reconnaissance by the underwater demolition teams. On Tinian, 
Fire Bombardment Group 2 was to continue throughout Dog Minus One Day and Dog Day with a mission to destroy and neutralize enemy guns and defenses, which could interfere with the landing on Saipan. On Dog Day against Saipan by Bombardment Groups 1 and 2, counter-battery fire commencing near dawn and intense destructive fire on beach defenses and installations by ships, then to the flanks and inland to O-1 line until lifted by order. Main batteries to lift fire when the LVTs were 1,200 yards from the beaches, and secondary batteries when the LVTs were 300 yards from the beaches. In addition, close supporting fire in the Tanapag Harbor area to cover the demonstration. The close fire support plan for naval gunfire called for the following. How minus 60 until about how minus 30, fire support unit 8 was to deliver heavy caliber enfilade fire on areas in the vicinity of beaches red, green, blue, and yellow. Fire support units 1, 2, and 3 were to deliver counter-battery fire during this period. After LCIGs in blue and yellow boat lanes passed the line of fire support ships, fire was to be modified on scheduled targets. This was to ensure safety to LCIGs and boatways. From how hour to how hour plus 30, one heavy cruiser and two destroyers were to leave assigned stations, clear boat lane area, and take positions to deliver scheduled fires. One light cruiser was to remain in position and prepare to fire on a Fetna point on order. Other ships were to fire as per schedule. The gunboat support group made up of LCIGs were to form and proceed from the line of departure in advance of landing waves. Upon reaching line of fire support ships, this support group was to open fire on beach areas with all 40 millimeter guns. LCIGs in red and green boat lanes were to remain at line of close fire support ships and continue firing 40 millimeter guns as long as safety to landing craft permitted. It emphatically was stressed that rockets were not to be fired by the LCIGs in these lanes. LCIGs of blue and yellow boat lanes were to fire ranging rockets when 1,200 yards from shore and were to fire rocket salvos when effective range was reached. They were to remain approximately 1,000 yards offshore and continue rocket and 40 millimeter fire on beaches as long as safety to landing craft permitted. After the last assault wave passed the line of LCIGs, the boat lane area was to be cleared and fire continued along the southern flank of Beach Yellow. Aircraft of Task Forces 58, 53, and 52 were to provide support for the capture of Saipan. On Dog Minus Two Day, fighter sweeps on airfields of Saipan and Tinian for the purpose of destroying enemy aircraft. There also was to be protection for minesweepers and other missions as ordered. The maintenance of smokers for the purpose of laying smoke between minesweepers and enemy guns. And finally, combat air patrol as well as anti-submarine patrol. The missions for Dog Minus One were as follows. The destruction of inland, coast defense and dual purpose guns on Saipan and Tinian. The destruction of anti-aircraft guns on Saipan and Tinian. The firing of sugarcane fields not already burned in this area. The destruction of buildings around Aslito Airport. And the destruction of communications and transportation facilities on the west coast of Saipan. In addition, there were to be continued fighter sweeps on Saipan and Tinian combat air and anti-submarine patrols, a daytime coverage for maintenance of coordination of air activities, call strikes, coverage for demolition units operating off the western beaches of Saipan, and a photographic plane for the purpose of taking vertical photographs. On dog day, the following air support was to be furnished. Combat air and anti-submarine patrols, air coordinator, air observers, photographic plane, artillery spotters, smokers, fighter sweeps, heavy landing strike. In the event weather prevented execution of this mission by naval aircraft, naval gunfire was to be prepared to conduct fire on air objectives during this period. Call strikes and strike aircraft. In this latter instance, the following missions were to be carried out. 
counter battery fire against inland guns firing from Saipan and Tinian, and the destruction of those guns and installations that cannot be seen from our ships. The destruction of mobile artillery pieces with special emphasis on those on the slopes overlooking the landing areas of Saipan. The destruction of enemy personnel and vehicles moving either to or from the landing beaches and in the vicinity of the sugar cane fields and hills. And the dislocation of communications by bombardment of important road junctions. Instructions for aircraft supporting attack on Saipan emphatically stress that under no circumstances were pilots to fly through high-angle gunnery curtains and that special precautions had to be taken to avoid flying through fire from mortars, rockets, and field artillery. Air observers were instructed to report immediately to commander support aircraft any change in front lines, or to report any change, if such were the case, hourly on the hour. Instructions for marking front lines were to be observed scrupulously. Failure of troops to mark front lines on request was to be reported to commander support aircraft. The movement of assault and garrison elements to Saipan from the Hawaiian area and the South Pacific was echelon. The first elements departed from the Hawaiian area on 26 May 1944. By 31 May, the majority of the reserve troops departed Pearl Harbor. During this period of movement by the assault forces, preparatory bombardment of the target areas had begun. On 3 June, aircraft of the Southwest Pacific Forces began the bombardment of Palau Island. And from the 9th until the target date, these islands and those in the Western Carolines were harassed daily by aircraft. En route to Enowitok, an unusual amount of emphasis was placed on indoctrination and the training program. The program was based upon the premise that knowledge of a complete picture of operations would aid all hands in the best execution of their orders intelligently and would permit them to act with greater initiative in emergencies. All possible means, including lectures, demonstrations, question and answer periods, relief models, charts, Aerial and surface photos, motion pictures, drills and so forth were to describe the immediate task ahead. The movement to the staging area at Enoweetok was uneventful and without incident. Planes were held here, ready to be transferred to Saipan, when an airfield on that island was captured. By 11 June, Northern Attack Force reassembled at Enoweetok and departed for the target. The same day, Task Force 58 initiated its three and one half days intense carrier and surface bombardment on Saipan. Tinian. installations and facilities of all types were struck. Late photographic coverage of the landing beaches were secured. During the night, harassing and illuminating fires were maintained on Saipan and Tinian by destroyers. On D-1, 14 June, Bombardment Group 1, consisting of the fire support ships of the Northern Attack Force, Task Force 52, 
joined the fast carrier task forces in a deliberate bombardment of the landing beaches and installations on Saipan. This bombardment covered minesweeping activities in the vicinity of the island and the work of underwater demolition teams, which reconnoitered and cleared the beaches of obstacles in preparation for the landing. Elements of Task Force 58 were detached on D-1 to undertake the first in a series of carrier strikes in support of the Saipan operation on the Bonin and Volcano Islands, north of the Marianas. At 0452, 15 June, Commander Task Force 52 signaled, execute attack order all, 4-4. Transports arrived in the transport area off Saipan at 0524. Vice Admiral Turner signals to the transport group commanders, take charge. Good luck. Fire support ships started the preliminary bombardment at 0530 on schedule. The weather was favorable. Flying conditions good. Wind east, 13 knots. Moderate swell. Transports and LSTs arrived on schedule in assigned areas off the island and commenced launching boats and LVTs. The four LSDs carrying medium tanks in LCMs launched promptly. After the transports arrived, Key naval and marine personnel were embarked in LCCs. Although this operation was carried out smartly, there was a delay in getting all control craft to their assigned stations. As the light improved, on the right could be seen the town of Charanconoa and the reef channel opposite its pier. To the north was Garapan, the capital city. In its harbor, Tenepag Harbor, could be seen beached, half-sunken, and smoking ships, the results of the previous day's air and naval strikes. In the harbor was tiny fortified Managiasa Island. Aboard the ships, all was ready. Guns and winches were manned. Boats were being lowered and hatches cleared. Troops were alerted and waiting. A diversionary demonstration began off Tenepag Harbor. Boats were lowered, troops embarked, waves formed and proceeded to 5,000 yards off black beaches, where the force circled for 10 minutes. Off Charin Kanoa, shortly after 0700, the LSTs carrying assault LTs moved into position to launch their vehicles near the line of departure. The area near the line of departure showed increasing activity. Control vessels and guide boats were on station. Each carried its identifying flag. LCI scheduled to precede the first wave to the reef, nosed into position, and hundreds of landing vehicles circled in groups, forming their waves. At 8 minus 90 minutes, naval gunfire ceased on the landing beaches. A heavy bombing strike was placed on the beaches and was followed by a strafing attack parallel to the beach. Planes retired, and the entire beach area was obscured by flame, smoke, and dust as the warships again took over and concentrated their fire for the final and heaviest preparation of the immediate landing beaches. HR was delayed 10 minutes to 0840. The line of departure was 4,000 yards from the beach. It was about a 27-minute run by LVT to the beach. 